Shabbat Shalom, Shana Tova. Rabbi Cosgrove and I had a good friend, uh, Rabbi Adam Feldman, who passed away uh, a few years ago. And Adam used to write his sermons in July, right? Middle of summer, he'd be done, kicked up, ready, waiting for the holidays. And uh, I can assure you, your rabbis don't write their sermons in July. <laughs> Lesson to our intern, a lot can happen between July and the high holidays, um, including your work husband basically giving your Yom Kippur sermon that you were thinking about giving about Giannis, right? <laughs> so remember thinking about it, I'll tell you, it was better and it was shorter, right? <laughs> Yasher Koch, beautifully done. Uh, he's got a comment. People might not remember what I just said. Well, by I, you know, I was thinking that, like, if it was a year, maybe, but I think a week is pushing, uh, <laughs> pushing that. So, Shana Tova, everybody. It's great. Uh, it's great to see everyone here. Like many of you of a certain age, when I celebrated my bar mitzvah years ago, I received a number of certificates from Karen Kayemet Li Israel, the Jewish National Fund, stating that a tree had been planted in my honor in Israel, right? You remember this. And like many of you over the years, I thought about that tree or those trees a lot, right? Which was this sort of physical manifestation of our relationship to the Jewish homeland. Where was it? Was it being cared for? Was there perpetual care on my tree, right? <laughs> How had it grown over the years? How was it doing? And I remember my first trip to Israel, how excited I was to go and find all the trees that had been planted on my behalf only to discover that among the 240 million trees that had been planted in Israel since its founding, there was not a section set aside to honor Neil Zuckerman's entry into Jewish adulthood. <laughs> so yes, I am aware that the trees planted in Israel by individuals or honoring individuals are not, in fact, labeled. But this past summer, while I was there, I set out to find one tree. My quest took me to a place called Sha'ar Hagai. Sha'ar Hagai is a site, it's a museum, it's a memorial located on the road that connects Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. It was a road that actually saw fierce battles during the War for Independence in 1948, later becoming a heritage center dedicated to the memory of those brave soldiers who fought there and broke through the road to Jerusalem. It was a powerful emotionally impactful place that tells the story of this truly critical moment in Israel's founding. But the real reason I went there was to be present in a place where a largely unknown and forgotten event occurred in the history of the Jewish people. The date was February 14, 1949. A few weeks earlier, Israel had held its first election as a sovereign nation. It's a miraculous moment in its own right. And on this day, February 14, 1949, the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, was going to meet for the first time in Jerusalem on King George Street. You've walked by this place. If you've been to Jerusalem, you've been to Ben Yehuda, you've walked by it. You don't even know it's there unless you read the sign because it is a dilapidated structure that is waiting to be, uh, to be renovated. And on his way to this historic gathering in Jerusalem, David Ben-Gurion stopped at Sha'ar Haggai, where only a year before so many had died attempting to break the Arab siege of Jerusalem and open up the road. And what did Ben-Gurion do there? He planted a tree. And that's the tree I wanted to see. Now, of all the things that Ben-Gurion could have done that morning on his way to the first meeting of the Knesset, why did he stop to plant a tree? 
Well, the easy answer is that February 14, 1949, was Tu B'Shvat. Danny Gordis describes how Tu B'Shvat became significant in Israel because it filled a void on the Jewish calendar. We know, according to the Torah, when the Israelites left Egypt, when the Torah was given, we know the year that the temples were destroyed. But what we don't know is when the Israelites actually entered the land of Israel after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. As Gordis writes, in the Zionist reinvention of the Jewish calendar, Tu B'Shvat assumed that role. And while we have a photo of Ben-Gurion planting a tree on this day, there's another photo from the same day of a group of school children gathered near the Knesset in Jerusalem in front of a sign celebrating Tu B'Shvat, quoting a verse from Isaiah, in days to come, Jacob shall take root, Israel shall bud and flower. It was a monumental occasion. Jews were gathering in the Knesset to begin governing the Jewish state and charting the Jewish future. The act of Ben-Gurion planting a tree on Tu B'Shvat and the verse from Isaiah on the sign behind the school children in Jerusalem perfectly captured the meaning of the moment. But there's another verse that comes to mind when I reflect on this image of Ben-Gurion planting a tree at this historic moment. And the verse actually provides a wider perspective to the meaning of this moment. Ki adam sadeh, the Torah teaches in Deuteronomy. A human being is akin, a human being is similar, a human being is like a tree in the field. Now why is that? Why are human beings compared to trees? What qualities do we share with trees? Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik teaches that humans, like trees, have roots. We have a past. We're defined by them. We are connected to them. Trees also point to the future and the importance of growing, changing, how planting a tree in our tradition is the ultimate expression of faith. There is, of course, the famous story of Honey, which you'll hear over and over again. I mean, it's actually so popular that when Menachem Begin visited the White House to see President Ronald Reagan for the first time, Reagan actually quoted the Honey story in his, in his remarks. Honey, knowing, uh, planted a tree. He was an older or man by then, knowing that it would take 70 years for the tree to bear fruit. He wouldn't be around to enjoy it. The man asks, why are you planting a tree? And Honey replies, just as my ancestors planted for me, I too am planting for future generations, for my descendants. Trees matter. They anchor us to our past, they anchor us in our present, and they orient us towards a sense of hope and optimism in the future. That is certainly one way to understand the meaning of Ben-Gurion's decision to plant a tree on this historically significant morning in 1949, and by extension, our gathering here together on Erev Rosh Hashanah. We feel connected to those who came before us. Maybe some of us went to the cemetery before the holiday to visit with our ancestors. We're grateful for the present, and we look forward to the year to come with that same sense of hope and optimism. And if this were all I had to say to you tonight, anticipating all that is to come in the new year, I would say, Dainu. That would be enough. But I want to push this metaphor a little further. Because the more we learn about trees and how trees interact with one another, the more we understand that trees have far more to teach us than the rabbis could have possibly known or imagined. For several years, I've been captivated by the writings of Dr. Suzanne Simard, the forest ecologist who has researched and has proven that trees communicate with one another. For a long time, she was actually ridiculed by fellow scientists for this belief. Now it is just simply accepted as fact, as science, 
that trees don't stand alone as individual organisms in a forest. They are connected below ground via a vast fungal network where they share resources. They're bound up with other trees around it, caring for one another, healing one another. In his book, The Hidden Life of Trees, Peter Wallabin describes one way, as an example, that trees communicate with each other. Not through speaking words, but through scent. Forty years ago, scientists in Africa noticed that giraffes were eating umbrella thorn acacia trees. The trees, as you can imagine, were unhappy about this. And within minutes, they began pumping toxic substances into their leaves to get rid of the giraffes. The message was received by the giraffes. They moved on to other trees to find food. Here's the fascinating thing about the story. They didn't just move on to the tree next door. They went about 100 yards away, and there they began, they resumed eating from the trees. Why? Because the acacia trees actually released warning gas to neighboring acacia trees that a crisis was at hand. And at that moment, the neighboring trees began filling their leaves with the same toxins to defend themselves. Only further upwind did giraffes find trees that didn't receive the warning, because they were beyond the range of the toxins. Ki adam Human beings are like trees. It doesn't only mean that like trees, we are rooted in the past and place. Samard's research unlocks new possibilities, new understanding, new understandings to this verse. We are like trees because we are connected. We're intertwined. We care for one another. We share resources with one another. And we protect one another. That's what it means to be part of a people, to be part of a sacred community. This image has been my North Star in the past year as we went through the process of establishing and then hiring a social worker for Park Avenue Synagogue for our community. We are large. Our pastoral needs are great. Our communal mental health needs are vast. To truly meet our community where we are, we felt we needed a social worker, full-time, on staff, who could function as a valuable and consistent clinical resource for our 1,800 membership families. Our lay leadership, who feel that web of interconnectedness, who understand the obligation to care for one another, stepped up and made our vision a reality. Suzanne Redlick officially started at Park Avenue Synagogue on September 11th, this past Monday. She's just learning her way around the building, so give her a little time. But she is here and ready for the sacred work that we will do together. Suzanne, would you stand up, please? Everybody, please welcome. Suzanne, welcome to our family. Meet all your new friends. <laughs> this year marks 100 years since the publication of Martin Buber's I and Thou. It's a book that makes the case that human life finds its meaningfulness in relationships, in community, in interconnectivity. When Buber was asked, where can I find God? He would respond that when two people are truly present for one another, <clears throat> when they seek the humanity in the other and not just see them as objects, when they support 
each other, protect each other, then and only then, God fills the space between them and joins them to each other. God, Buber would say, is found in relationships. Look at the people sitting around you, in front of you, behind you, next to you. They're your family. They're your friends. They're part of your community. You don't stand alone as we come together to meet the blessings and the challenges that life will bring us this year. That's what it means to say, ki adam eitz hasadeh, that we are like trees. That person sitting next to you, you are rooted to them. This year, they will welcome new life into their lives. You will have the opportunity to feel that life glow, that life force, as you celebrate this sacred moment with them. The person sitting in front of you, you are connected to them. They will struggle professionally in the year to come. You will have the opportunity to support them and to lift them up when the future feels dark and narrow and the nourishment you provide will comfort and inspire them. And the person behind you, you sustain them. They will lose a loved one in the year to come. You will have the opportunity to console them, to care for them when they are in pain. And while they may struggle to make it through the valley of the shadow of death, your support, your love, will help them reach the other side. You know, I never did find the tree that Ben-Gurion planted in 1949. But it actually doesn't really matter. Because wherever that tree is, it is rooted. It is connected to all the other trees in the forest. For all I know, it's even connected to one of the trees that was planted in my honor in 1982. <laughs> and as I walk through the hallowed grounds of Sha'ar Haggai, steeped in history, surrounded by trees, I reflected on the fact that I'm blessed to be part of something, connected to a people, connected to a place, to a homeland, and connected to a community. And I thought about a quote I had tucked away a long time ago from Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan in his book, The Future of the American Jew. He said, a community is a form of social organization in which the welfare of each is the concern of all and the life of the whole is the concern of each. I realized that in its finest moments, when fulfilling its mission to be a sacred community, a synagogue is a forest a place where we are all connected and part of each other's ecosystem. May 5784 be a year of caring for our forest. By looking after our inner tree, by stretching vertically up to the heavens, searching for new light while we grow our souls and reaching out horizontally, nurturing each other's souls with our deep and our mighty roots. From all of us to all of you, it's good to see you. It's good to be together. We wish you a sweet, a happy, and a health-filled new year. Shabbat shalom, shana tovah.